Good evening. We are going to talk about abdominal pain. This is a topic that is seen a lot in the EMS circles. Um, and I want to start with this because when, when we all go to school, they, they teach us about upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. These are quadrants, um, Meloshan quad, which is four. Um, and so there are four quadrants. Um, the problem is, how do you describe more diffuse pain? Or even what, if we look at the next picture, uh, a great way to describe it will be periumbilical. There are so many patients that have a pain right there, right in the center. And regardless of what it is, we just need a better way to describe it. So what are you going to write? That it's at the junction of the upper right, the upper left, the lower right and lower left? That's ridiculous. So there are other names and other regions that we can use. There is also a way to divide this into nines. Nines. And then you'd have three lines down, three lines across, Looks a little bit like a, an advanced tic-tac-toe, but um, it's complex. It's very complex, in, you know, even for me. So I like this one. So we have three regions here. Um, the upper abdominal region, uh, anything basically until and below the diaphragm, will be known as the epigastric region. That's pretty easy, right? Epigastric. Remember, epi in medicine always means above, on top of, right? So, for example, the um, the heart is the myocardium. Above the heart is the epicardium, right? Below it will be the endo. So, it's just a, an idea of using the word epigastric region means right above. The center, the umbilicus, we're going to call the periumbilical region. And that's a great way to describe the pains that people maybe are having. Maybe that's where they are pointing to. Maybe that's what they're telling you. All right. And below that, we're just going to call it the pelvic region. Please mute. Please mute yourselves. That's real. Please mute unless you want to talk to me. And that's fine too. If you want to talk to me, please unmute at any time. Um, pelvic reg region. Um, so when we deal with, let's say, with females and some of the female problems and, and pains and different things, um, it, it'll just be known as a pelvic problem or pelvic inflammatory disease. Pretty much means that the doctor has absolutely no idea what's wrong, but we're just referring to lower abdomen. And again, can be used for male, female, still going to be the pelvic region because of the pelvic bones that we find on either side. So, yeah, this is a pretty good um, thing to add to your arsenal or to your vocabulary if you're not already using it. So when I made this back in... 2020, January 2020, so pre-COVID, um, I figured, what's wrong, right? Somebody's complaining of bellyache, abdominal pain, and I came up with a small list. Um, I think we could double, triple this list if we really wanted um, of all the different problems. So like, like I have a colleague who says, he hates going on abdominal calls because he can't figure out what it is. Look at this, look at this list, right? There's so many things and so many parts, and so much can get infected. Um, it's very hard to know. And 
That's very true. So the good news is that we don't have to actually make a diagnosis. We do want a... Um, is that me? We do. We definitely want a working diagnosis, uh, 100%. We want a working diagnosis. Um, but at the same time, we don't always have to make a diagnosis that is going to that's going to make a lot of difference. So basically we can figure out what is going on as best as possible. I wish I knew who to mute. Mute all. Yes. Okay. Um, totally from a basically like a cardiac point of view. Uh, my grandfather happened to die from an aneurysm in his heart, but the chief complaint was severe abdominal pain. Is there anything that EMTs could could not differentiate, at least on this level? Um, you know, something that we could see that would say this sounds way more cardiac than let's say uh, appendicitis, something like that. Yeah. So. You know, I mean, a triple A, a, a rupture of the triple A, that's definitely cardiac because it has to do with the aorta, but that will present in the abdomen. Um, you're talking about an MI that's presenting with abdominal pain. Is that what you're asking me? Correct, because the reason why uh, he wasn't treated right away is they assumed that his assisted living, that it was like, okay, it's a time it's going to go away. And then the next time they're going to check it in, he's unresponsive already. So it's like, you know, sometimes people come in and they say it's a stomach ache um, and it could be just bad food or poisoning. And sometimes it's something like this. So I'd like to know, you know, the warning signs or something to say, you know, even though stomach pain, this is something that you move quick with. Don't wait. All right, so I'm going to turn your question around. I'm going to ask you how old was or is your Zayda, whoever that was you're referring to. He was 82 and a half, and it happened a couple of years ago. Okay, 82. And he had no cardiac history beforehand. That was a... Okay, any diabetes? No, no diabetes. He had arthritis, that's about it. Okay, so the I don't want to get into that topic right now because that's more for a cardiac night. However, I will say like this. There are three groups of people who can... What, what ended up being, what, what was it, a triple A? Yeah, it was a triple A issue. And unfortunately, when they came to check up on him later, it was unresponsive, respiratory failure, respiratory rest, cardiac arrest. They couldn't, um, uh, had a, when the medic came, he said right away, he's like, this is full cardiac. You know, because he wasn't in arrest right away. He's like, this is total cardiac. This is not abdominal pain. This is manifesting itself as abdominal pain. That's not what it is. No, a triple A would be, would. More tearing pain. Yeah. So, what, I, what I'm going to say is, and I don't want to get into cardiac right now, but a AAA often, not always, you can feel a pulsating mass in the oh, end. Yeah. And really, you're asking me what an EMT can do is to do a full, full head-to-toe um, assessment and to push in on the chest. So if you did your basic palpating before quads, that was coming right away. Yeah. Okay. Except Thanks. you can't. Uh, except you can't. Uh, you're not supposed. You're not supposed to touch the mess. Um. Well, you're not supposed to push it hard, but you could definitely um, feel it. All right. So here's a case that. I put together back then, ambulance crew responds to abdominal pain. EMS crew finds a male in his mid-30s complaining of right lower quadrant discomfort. Patient who is laying on his right side in the field position says the pain started two hours ago and he has never felt like this before. Okay, so a very classic uh, textbook abdominal pain call. Um, the physical assessment that they did reveals that the patient is conscious, oriented, with a heart rate of 110, sinus tech. 
Right? Remember, sinus tech is the most common cardiac rhythm for anybody who is sick uh, in any any type of thing, pretty much. So it's the most common. So you should expect your patient to be tachycardic, okay, when you get to a call and someone's got a bellyache or whatever it is, um, you would expect them to be tachycardic. Respiratory rate is 32. What's that? Is that good, bad, and different? What do you say? Way too fast. Thank you. That's way too fast. Way too fast. Good. We all in agreement. And a blood pressure, 132 over 70. To me, that's fine. Like I'm not getting excited about that pressure. So from this, 110, I expect tachycardia. 32, I don't know why he's tachypnic right now. And 132 over 70 tells me that he's not in shock. Okay? Not at least right away. You could want to make the argument that the increase in heart rate, meaning the tachycardia and the tachypnea, are compensating and therefore keeping the pressure up. I'll accept that if you want to go there or if you even understand what I just said. Um, but there is, you know, um, compensated shock, decompensated shock. So in compensated shock, we would see tachycardia, tachypnea, um, and the blood pressure would remain in the normal range. He is able to speak incomplete sentences, right? And denies any cardiac or respiratory complaints. So that's very good, okay? That he doesn't have difficulty breathing, SOB, right? All good. Patient says he has experienced a cramping sensation around his umbilicus earlier. I'm sure the patient didn't use the word umbilicus, but now the EMT is writing the report. And the discomfort has become more constant. Okay. So this, if if you don't already know, I'm I hope all of you know the at least the working differential here is gonna be an appendicitis. Appendix. Right. I hope you all got that from the very first part of the case. However, there's a lot that we can learn, meaning like this that appendicitis typically will start periumbilical, okay? So this whole right-sided thing is after a couple of hours. And this is exactly what he's showing here. And his discomfort has become more constant. Discomfort appears to be sharp, localized to the lower right quadrant, right? Lower right side of his abdomen. Head-to-toe assessment reveals that the patient has a tender right lower abdominal quadrant. Now, I'm going to stop here, and I want to talk about the word tender. So we need to understand, what is the word tender? What does it mean? And what are the two various forms of tenderness? What are the two types? So what does it mean? Tender means I touch, you say ow, or you show a sign of pain whether it's wincing, screwing up your face, screaming, pushing me away, whatever it is. That is what tender means. If you walk into a room and uh, finds a male in his mid thirties complaining of lower right, right quadrant discomfort, patient is laying right side. I'm just reading the first paragraph again. Pain started at 12 ago. So all that describes pain. It cannot describe tenderness. Okay, just so we get the language and the understanding. He's not tender until the EMT or the medic actually places their fingers, their hand on his body and now pushes. That's the first thing to understand. There's pain and separate from pain, there is tenderness. Now, in tenderness, there are two types. One is called point tenderness. So where I push in, I look at the patient's face while I'm doing it, 
and I see that they are in obvious pain as I'm pushing in. That's one type of tenderness, and we call it point, point tenderness. The other type is called rebound tenderness. Rebound tenderness is where I push in, hold it there a minute, and pull my hand away fast. If they complain now, rather than while I was pushing in, this is a sign of peritonitis, some sort of infection um, in the abdomen, typically. So you see the difference between these two? Point tenderness where I touch, rebound tenderness when I let go. All right. The remainder of the assessment is unremarkable. And then we write, no masses. Okay, so we're not ruling out a AAA. Sign of trauma, unnoted. Good. Patient has no significant medical history, which is, you know, out of the blue. That's the appendicitis. Oh, so, you know, very much it's out of the blue. And denies the use of drugs or alcohol. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Um, denies the use, um, as well as nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. So I think I should have written this a little better, but his denying is on all of this, okay? So no drugs, no alcohol, no nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. It's a pretty good note, right? I, I wrote it. <laughs> I hope it's a good note. So this tells me what's going on. We don't have a pain scale from 1 to 10. Um, what else don't we have? Anybody else got something we can maybe to make this note better? What would we add? No? Did the patient take anything? Yeah, is there any position that the patient feels better in, okay? So I would add those things. I think they are just part of your OPQRST, but I think that they are important. That's really it. That's the case for us to think about. So the big question, to ALS or not to ALS, okay? And that is the question. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer, okay? Um, I'm going to make a case for both. So supplemental oxygen today, right? Um, we don't give oxygen to everybody. Today, we want to maintain an SpO2 of 94 or higher. We said that he was having no difficulty breathing. Uh, and it's very possible that his oxygen level is SpO2, is within normal range. During transport to the hospital, he remains on his right side, the legs drawn in. He complains of lower right abdominal discomfort, as we mentioned, and he's becoming nauseous. Vital signs are repeated as the crew arrives at the hospital. So... We have we have medics on tonight. Who? What could we do? What could a medic do here that an EMT can't do? If there would be nausea, then you give Zofran. If okay. Be the nausea. Yeah. So we can treat the nausea. Yeah. What else? So there's two things that come to my mind okay the first one is pain management all right and that really is in my opinion one of the most important things about having medics on your call especially this call pain management you know how long it's going to take for him to receive pain management i don't care which hospital you go to okay i i believe that it is incumbent upon us to help 
people in pain. And this guy is obviously in pain. We don't know on what scale, but I can tell you if it's a male patient, it's probably about 40 out of 10. And, um, you know, uh, female patients could be almost dying in pain and they'll be like, well, it's about a two, you know. So we see this a lot between the, the differences. But listen, it is what it is. Um, male patient, probably in extreme pain. Medics have great drugs to deal with this and to help them. So that would be the next thing. Um, and the last thing is end tidal CO2. We know that he is tachypnic. We know that he's breathing you know, more than 10 times a minute. We said, I think, 32. So he's blowing off a lot of CO2. Um, so for the medics, what's going on? Why is he blowing off CO2? What is happening on a physiological level with pH, um, acid base, all this sort of thing is for a medic to think about. So I guess they didn't call for a medic, but it remains always an open question. All right, let's talk about the abdomen a little bit. It's the largest cavity in the body. Um, for some of us, larger than others. The abdominal wall is lined with the peritoneum. I mentioned before peritonitis, which will be an infection of said peritoneum which is the lining of most, not all, most of the abdominal organs. Uh, and look what I wrote, which is the majority of abdominal organs are contained. Okay, so for example, just say that the kidneys and the pancreas are not in the peritoneum. We call those retro peritoneum. They are behind it. And look, I wrote, says it here. Um, the diaphragm, we know, separates the abdomen from the thorax. So until the abdomen, until the diaphragm, it's all up there. It's all called thorax, uh, thoracic cavity. From the diaphragm down is abdomen, abdomen or abdominal cavity. The abdominal wall is... Um, is the anterior border with the spine becoming the posterior border. So it goes um, AP from anterior to posterior. Lateral walls are the flanks. We call them flank areas. And then we will find the kidneys. Kidneys are somewhat to the back, but yeah, towards the flank. The epigastrum. All right. So that's just above the the uh, abdomen, the mid-upper abdomen, located just below xiphoid process, okay? So we, we saw that word earlier, we should know. To assist the abdominal organ location, the abdominal region can be divided quadrants. We spoke about that um, with a, you know, line through the umbilicus, and we divide into these... Are you Q, L U, right? A little Q and L U Q. Here we go. So here are your four quadrants. This is what I like to use a lot: the epigastrum, the peri umbilical. And then we should know what we find in each one. So when we talk about right, we're talking about liver and gallbladder, right? When we talk about lower right, we've got the appendix, which is that piece there. We don't even know why a Kodesh Baruch Hu put it there. On the right upper, you have the kidney as well. What? The right upper and the left upper, you have the kidney. No, but they are retroperitoneal. They're not here. They're in the back. But the pain will radiate, the pain will radiate to the 
to the front? Mm. All right, hold off on kidneys right now. All right. Um, left, we've got the spleen and the stomach. And just intestine in the left low. So these are things that we should understand, be aware of. All right. All right. Abdominal pain, common complaint. 10% of emergency visits. That's a lot, right? 10% of emergency department visits. Abdominal pain can be associated with nausea, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, dark stools, known as melanin, and urinary symptoms. So lots of things. Good history should include the location, the onset, if it was sudden or gradual, uh, intensity, quality, Right, that means describing the pain, progression, where did it start and where has it gone to, um, and if it's intermittent or if it's constant, right, you know, the uh, type of the pain, as well as any associated symptoms. So there's so much that you need to really find out from the patient to get that history um, to make it, you know, get the best possible story that you can. Um, now, aggravating or leading factors. That's what I said before. Does anything make it better or worse? Definitely things to consider. Um, past medical and surgical history. We always want to look to these things to see if they've had anything in the, in the past. Um, Women of childbearing age, we have to always think of possible ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy outside of the uterus, somewhere else. Um, ectopic is a word that means in the wrong place. In the wrong that would only that would be six to eight weeks after the last period. No, it could be even three. Three or four weeks. Don't have to wait that long. Um, an acute abdomen, right? You hear the word acute abdomen. Um, this is where you will do a physical exam, and then there will be something like rigidity, guarding. They'll move your hand away. They won't let you, you know, touch because it's so painful. Um, so, yeah, determining the exact cause can be challenging, especially in the pre-hospital setting. And that's very true. Okay. Um, so just quickly talk on some of the things that we can see. Appendicitis. Again, I put here the different regions. Um, if you unmute yourself, please remute yourself when you're done. Um, Zachary Cope once said, I have no idea who that is, but it's a good line. Acute appendicitis can mimic any intra-abdominal process, therefore... To know acute appendicitis is to know well the diagnosis of acute abdominal pain. Um, so I don't know who that is. Um, I can tell you a true story that my daughter was learning in uh, Eretz Yisrael Seminary. And I got a call about various um, pains and problems that she was having when she was in. I told her to go to get some medical attention. She went to some, like a type of Israeli urgent care. Um, forgotten the name, what they called it. And they told her to, you know, drink some water and, you know, take to Tylenol, call them in the morning or something. Next day, she's calling me again, crying in so much pain. And I started to ask her questions and I had her, had a friend do an abdominal exam for me 
over a phone. Um, and I tell it, I told her that she's got an appendicitis and she needs to call 911 or whatever the number is to matter and go to the hospital. And um, she did. And uh, I got on a flight that night and um, she was in Hadassah in Karen. And uh, yeah, uh, the rest is history. She had it removed, uh, emergency surgery overnight. So it's not something that you should play with or, you know, take lightly. Uh, acute appendicitis uh, is an inflammation of the appendix, which is uh, right there at the end of the, uh, of the intestine. And then there can be, um, you know, uh, bacteria, um, infections, um, and you don't want it to rupture uh, because then it's going to get into the whole peritoneum and going to cause lots more problems. Uh, incidence of appendicitis can be as high as 25% for males, 12% for females. So even though uh, female, in my case, but um, only half the, uh, the number of appendicitis. Uh, though appendicitis may occur at any age, adolescents and young adults account for the majority of the cases. So she fit, you know, being in seminary, that makes her, I guess, an adolescent or and or a young adult and um, but not male. Characteristic uh, acute appendicitis. Until what age? Until what age is this, um Yeah, I don't know. Is it? Okay. I don't know. Uh, young adults, I think, usually are till mid twenties, maybe thirty. Character. Do you find do you find this in forty and fifty year olds as well? Um, it can, but here we're talking about the ones that get it. Um, high incidence. Okay. Yep. Um. So acute appendicitis, abdominal pain um, can be associated with anorexia, nausea, vomiting. Pain often begins in the where? The peri-umbilical area. And that's why I want to right, teach that word and get people to want to know that area, peri-umbilical. Described as vague and crampy. As conditions persist, the pain may become steadily, become steady and sharp, localizing to the lower right quadrant. So it sort of moves from there down to here. And that's normal. That is the normal um, methodology. That's the normal way that appendicitis will happen. Now, you will have cases where people will be will say things like, no, no, I didn't have it near my um, umbilicus, didn't feel it there at all. Um, so either it wasn't um, painful enough for them to feel, um, or they, they felt it, but they just brushed it off as, you know, cramping, whatever, uh, you know, whatever yeah. it was. Okay, so this is possible. Here's again, nice picture of the appendix. We don't want it to rupture if we can. Um, so they may experience severe diffuse abdominal pain, vomiting, high grade fever. Okay, so these are things to look out for. Abdominal sesame may reveal a mass in the lower right quadrant, tender to palpation, okay? Or signs of peritoneal irritation, such as rebound, okay? So this is what I was explaining before. The way to find it is to do that um, test to push in and look for rebound tenderness. When you pull away, uh, they say, ow, well, now you know we're dealing with some sort of infection rather than something else. Um, movement of the patient, even bumping the stretcher, 
may elicit severe pain. Um, they often want to flex their legs. That means pull their knees up towards their chest. Um, and that often is the most comfortable for them. Um, so we, we don't really want this to, um, to burst, to rupture. Depending on when the cause of appendicitis patient has encountered, any number of presentations are possible. So be aware of possibility of appendicitis and virtually any patient can play abdominal pain. Um, when, when it becomes very difficult is let's say you have a female of childbearing age and she has the right-sided lower abdominal pain. So now my half of my brain is saying ectopic pregnancy uh, the other half of my brain is saying mm, appendicitis. I don't know. So you've got to get her in. We got to do some tests, some you know ultrasounds, and all sorts of stuff to figure out exactly which way we're we going with that. Um, just to finish the story, when when she got on the ambulance uh, to go to the hospital, they they called me from the ambulance and they asked me, which hospital would you like us to take her to? I said, the one with the least amount of camels walking around. Uh, I had no idea like what the hospital system was like in, in the Holy Land. And I figured, you know, it's a third world country and it's gonna be pretty bad. So they told me they're going to Shari Tzedek I said, I've heard of it, no problem. They called me back, Shari Tzedek's on diversion. They can't bring any patients there. I said, oh, great. So why didn't you tell me that before you gave me the option? So then they said, Hadassah in Karen. I said, great, never heard of it. Let's go there. Um, so just to get to the end of the story, I get there and it's a very modern building. Uh, it's got a huge mall underneath and upstairs, uh, floors and floors of hospital with, you know, it, it looks like a real country um, with good people, personnel. Um, I was able to stay there uh, next to her bed in her room. There was a, like a cart thing. And I stayed there for almost a week um, while she recovered. And uh, one thing and another, um, they... I asked them to change some of the treatment and they listened and they went with what I suggested. So it was, was very good. All right, a couple of other things that I'd like to touch on quickly. Uh, the main thing obviously I wanted to do was the appendicitis, but um, gallbladder, okay? Biliary colic, we do, I see a lot of these gallbladder attacks. Um, so again, the gallbladder has got the bile. It lives right below the liver, okay, on the right side. Um, and gallstone, I'll show, I, I think I have some pictures. Um, this is more female than male, okay? And um, look, over the age of 50, uh, gallstones. Um, Isn't it the four F? Okay. Four F, fat, female, fertile, and 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 forty. And what? And forty. What's forty? Forty years old. The three Fs. Oh, 40. Okay, got you. Four. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, there are there there is that um, the the uh, research that I found back then, twenty twenty, was that um, it's about twenty five percent of women and fifteen percent of men over the age of fifty. So I raised the forty to fifty. Um, and then you have one half million, that's 500,000 
um, of these uh, cholecystostomies. That means removal of the uh, gallbladder are performed in the United States. So that's quite a lot. So biliary colic is the primary symptom um, from majority of patients with gallstones. Develop symptoms, pain in the uh, biliary colic is most likely to occur when gallstones interrupt the normal flow of bile from the gallbladder into the bile ducts to the duodenum. Pain initially may develop in the epigastric area or may originate in the right upper quadrant. So you see there, epigastric means all the way across or more in the right upper quadrant. Pain may also extend on the right side of the rib cage, and it's possible pain to be poorly localized. I mean, they can't tell you really where the pain is. May radiate to the right posterior shoulder, and that's uh, always a clue. It's not in every case, but if they have pain, all right, to the right shoulder, very often that is a gallbladder attack. Um, onset of pain tends to occur shortly after eating. I was going to say fatty foods, but it says it there. Um, fatty, oily, um, you know, extra schmaltz. Um, so all these things can set it off. Repeat episodes. To, I always ask, what did you last eat? I always ask that with these patients. Uh, tend to involve greater frequency, intensity of symptoms. Most episodes subside within a few hours. Not always. However, the patient may report abdominal aching that lasts for days following the episode. Nausea often associated with it and vomiting may be present. Usually is. Fever and chills are not common symptoms in uncomplicated um, colic due to gallbladder stones. Okay, great. I like this picture. All right, this is not uh, at the beach. Okay, these these are stones that are found in the gallbladder. There's your gallbladder, that green thing. It sits nice right by the liver, and it will put the bile into the small intestine. Um, does some other stuff also, but that really that's all we need to know. And here we're looking at the epigastric region. That is where the pain will be, or going back to the quadrants, the right upper quadrant. Remember, pain, uh, radiating pain, referred to the right shoulder, to the right posterior shoulder. Yes. Cholecystitis, um, build up a bile in the gallbladder. So this is the bile in the gallbladder that can't um, get through. Um, then it becomes, the gallbladder becomes inflamed, uh, bacterial inf infection, perforation, yada, 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 can get worse. Um, so this is the cause of cholecystitis, um, itis, right, at the end, infection. Um, so things that make it worse are alcohol uh, tumors, uh, can also lead to gallstones. Um, more common in middle-aged women. Okay, so these are your Fs over here. There are two forms of cholecystitis: acute and chronic. Okay, acute involves inflammation, gallbladder results in abdominal pain during a specific episode. So that's acute. Chronic uh, is inflammation of gallbladder greater duration. Damage can lead to Scar and thicken organ, which can ultimately lead to the inability to go blood to store and release the bile. So basically, if you go back to the picture, so there can be the bile is supposed to be in here, and when there's a buildup because it's completely blocked, usually the blockage will be somewhere lower down. But if it's right there, it's completely blocked. Okay, so here goes the status again, greasy, fried, spicy, fatty foods, uh, acute cramping pain, the upper right quadrant, lasts more than six hours, discomfort. Here we're going to learn about Murphy's sign. 
Okay, Murphy sign. And I think if this link works, it'll be great. Um, we shall see. Let's see if this is a link on how to perform. Can you see? Murphy sign. Ask the patient to exhale while palpating the gallbladder area medial to the midclavicular line. Now instruct the patient to take a deep breath so the gallbladder is pushed down and against the examiner's fingertips as the lungs expand. If cholecystitis is present, the patient will experience a sharp and sudden pain causing them to abruptly cease inhalation. This reaction is known as a positive Murphy sign. Okay, you see how to do that? Not difficult. Uh, patient. That wasn't part of it. I don't know where that came from, but okay. Um, patient may experience fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, right? The usual. Uh, similar symptoms to an MI, such as epigastric discomfort, radiates to the shoulders. Again, there's something about the gallbladder with the shoulders. Diverticulitis. So we're going to need a picture. I hope I've got one. This is like a sack that bulges on the side of the uh, intestines. Um, or the bowel wall called diverticulum. Um, when there's one, they're called diverticula. Um, and the presence of diverticula is known as diverticulitis. So very big word, but it's a very common medical diagnosis. Uh, when the diverticulum become inflamed, right, inflamed, so now we got infection, we got itis at the end. Um, they may have few or no symptoms. Uh, symptoms may be vague, can include, can include guess, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, chills, and abdominal pain. I don't know if you're noticing like a uh, a trend here. Okay, the pain often begins in the hypogastric area. Hypogastric. I translate my own words. Below the umbilicus. All right. Uh, hypo means lo uh, lower, right? And we said that the peri umbilical was the umbilicus, and this is the hypogastrum. Comes more prominent lower left quadrant. So here, look, something different. Lower left quadrant. Patient may develop fever, fever tenderness of low fever. There will be tenderness over the left lower quadrant, rebound tenderness. As I told you, whenever there's infection, we're going to look for rebound tenderness. Diverticulitis may result in perforation or abscess formation. So here we go. Picture. Here's a diverticular. All right. And they can occur. It also has a very strong odor, right? Mm. The stool, stool has a strong odor and it's either a bright red or maroon. No, oh, bright red blood can be many things. But yes, there will be bleeding. All With right. a strong odor. Bowel obstruction or intestinal obstruction. Um, this um, intestinal wall um come back up and um there can be many sorts of um discomfort um can be in the peri umbilical or the supra pubic area uh abdominal distension nausea vomiting always always the same sort of thing that's going to happen here we've got let's say an intestinal obstruction so we can't get waste out through here. Uh, blockage. 
and uh, can't get through the colon. Renal colic, all right, my favorite, maybe yours too. Um, kidney stones in simple language. Um, so kidney stones affects more than 1 million people each year and accounts for 1% of all hospital admissions. So we said that, remember, abdominal complaints um, account for 10% of all ER visits and 1%, all right, hospital admissions. So that's a lot. Overall instance is males 12, females 5. So men win this one. Um, peak incidents between 35 and 45. Um, the pain is unbearable. Um, and I think they say it's the closest thing that a man can experience uh, to childbirth. It's the closest. Um, I disagree with that. And I say that when a man has a cold, that he's in way more pain than uh, a female giving birth. But anyway, um, dilation, stretching, spasm of the uterine um, caused by urethral obstruction from the stone. Now, the stone could be anywhere, okay? It could be actually in the kidney. Uh, it could be in the urethras, it could be in the utera, wh wherever it is. It can be anywhere. It's sudden onset, severe. There is no position of comfort. There is no, just nothing, just absolutely nothing. Uh, should you call a medic? I would say absolutely, because I've been there and... Pain meds, pain meds, lots of them. Um, pain originating in the flank area, sort of towards the back and the side of the abdomen, radiating inferiorly, right? So um, downwards and anteriorly to the lower quadrants or groin. Associated, of course, nausea, vomiting, blood in the urine, often reported. Hematuria, good word, blood in the urine, is absent in more than 15% of cases. Patients with anecolic tend to move around constantly. Yes, there is no con comfortable position. So they will sit, they will lie, they will walk, they will, there's just no position that gives any sort of, of comfort. Presence of a patient with left sided renal colic can be a similar patient with a thoracic aortic dissection, okay, or and AAA. So keep both entities in your differential for flying pain rating to the abdomen or groin. All right, so these are the nephrons of the, um, of the kidney. And see, we've created this usually made of salts, um, can be other things, but there we go, we're stuck. We're stuck and now urine isn't gonna be able to pass easily and we're not gonna get from the kidneys to the bladder, uh, et cetera. Triple A, here we go. Um, somebody mentioned this at the beginning. Um, and this is sort of a picture of the um, descending abdomen. Remember, it splits, the abdomen splits here. It's called the iliac crests, and then they become the femoral arteries. So here are the kidneys right in the back, and the abdomen, the uh, thoracic abdominal, the descending abdomen will be behind, posterior to the heart. And it is the largest 
aorta in the body, uh, the largest artery in the body, sorry, um, and goes from the left ventricle across, does the, the, the aortic arch, which will send blood up to the brain. And then this is the descending um, aorta. And this is where problems can happen. So it's called the thoracic aorta over here, and then it becomes the abdominal aorta. Um, supplies blood, lower part of the body, right? Um, carry blood to each leg, and I pointed that out already. Abdominal aortic aneurysm involves enlargement of the lining of the artery, okay? Um, when lining becomes weak, vessel wall is thin and expand the aneurysm ruptures the result can be devastating with a 80 percent fatality 80 percent um did your grandfather make it yeah that's not good hmm. common location for a AAA is below the area that branches off to supply to the kidneys. So that would be there, right? Kidneys just below there and above where it divides to support the pelvis and the legs. So where, where would the pain be in the back on the, on the AAA? Is that center? Mm, yeah, yeah, center. Yeah. Here's some more. Uh, normal aorta, large aneurysm, okay? And that would be the pulsating mass that you can feel? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, most commonly found in males over 60, more than 2% elderly population have aortic aneurysms. Remember, if they don't burst or they don't cause people problems, look, a pulsate, pulsatile abdomen, abdominal mass, may be pouted just above the umbilicus. You see, I thought of all your questions. It's all here. It's possible for the pancreas stomach to present a similar mass. So the presence of, a, of a abdominal mass does not always mean a AAA, but very often. However, if such a mass is noted, should suspect presence of AAA to prove otherwise. So yes, you've got to examine your patients. What what would um, medics do for a AAA? Transport fast. Give some fluids, and then you know evaluate the pain situation. Patients, what does the EKG look like on such a patient? What do you see? What does what look like? The EKG. It won't it won't show anything particular. Because EKG is, is is looking at the electricity as it passes through the heart. So if there is no problem with the heart putting, you know, a systole squeeze of the left ventricle up into the aorta, it won't show. It won't show anything exciting. Are these people typically taking cardiac and shortness of breath? Um... The, the back or flank pain is usually the, the thing that they complain about first. Um, obviously, if that, if that ruptures, they will be in hypovolemic shock. I mean, it will be like game over really quickly because there's no way to just like, you know, put a pressure bandage on it, okay? So... There's not much time. Um, will they have typically um, difficulty breathing? Do you use TXA for this? Is why T TXA is that blood clotting um, uh, medication? Yeah, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. That's only with external bleeding. No, wouldn't help. All right, so here's your assessment. Uh, these are things that we want to look for. Um, does the patient seem to be conscious, complain of abdominal or guarding the abdomen? Are they in the fetal position? Abdominal discomfort was the skin, right? Is it cold, pale, diaphoretic? Is it cyanotic? Cyanotic always makes you think about 
hypoxia. Any clues that reveal possible cause, right? Um, so these, you know, obviously your assessment is very important. Get a history. We spoke about it throughout. Get a detailed history, okay? Um, recent abdominal surgery, complications, reports of abdominal trauma. Ever felt like this in the past, right? Um, often, you know, I have patients that have had um, let's say gallstones in the past, and they tell me exactly this is how it is, this is what it was, and I just give them pain meds and take them in. Um, what are they taking? Alcohol or substance abuse, obviously. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those are your, your big ones that we spoke about. Um, and of course, females of childbearing age. Uh, we always going to be concerned. Um, so AAA often will be a sudden, intense, excruciating pain, right? It's not something that's, you know, yeah, I've been like this for a couple of hours. Usually it's, it's out of the blue. Um, so... We have hollow and solid organs. Um, hollow organs usually crampy sensation, poorly localized, um, and then solid organs uh, more steady or constant. Um, peritonitis, right? We spoke about infection of the lining um, and things like appendicitis. Examination, we spoke about this. Um, we need to really do a full hands-on uh, check of the abdomen and see what's going on. Complete set of vitals, because it really does make a difference and it is important. Um, orthostatic changes, it's not done by EMTs much these days, but I, I wish they would. Um, so, we do it to uh, rule out dehydration. Okay. If it's a, a 10 to 5, 10 to 20 point difference on the blood pressure and heart rate. Right. So I'm telling you here to use a 20, 10, 20 rule. Um, so decrease in systolic by 20, rise in diastolic by 10, or increase in heart rate by 20. Um, so that tells you what on the uh, on abdominal? Um, What's... Well, usually it's for volume, uh, for like dehydration, uh, for dehydration. Volume, uh, depletion. Um, so it says, right, assessing for static is not recommended if they are tachycardic or hypotensive um, when they're sitting or supine, because it doesn't really make a difference at that point. Treatment will depend on, you know, what, what the symptoms are, whether you get a medic or not, whether there's pain meds needed or not. That's all really up to you. There are, um, I write here about fentanyl for abdominal pain, um, rapid onset. Okay. And it's, it's very good. We have uh, lots of pain meds that we can use uh, for different you know, different protocols. Here is just a list of, um, you know, what's what's in each quadrant, if you're interested in that. Solid organs, so your liver, spleen, pancreas, kidneys, adrenals, and ovaries, hollow organs. The ovaries makes it into both lists. And then, you know, various problems based on various um, quadrants, what is more likely, okay? Um, 